And so we want to have you on talk some lake trout. Uh, and that's kind of the main thing. It's funny, you get out east and everybody wants to talk about salmon. They can't figure out why all of our pictures from Lake Superior are, all have lake trout on them. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the lake trout. And with this winter the way it's been, do you think that's going to have any effect on the season this year and maybe as a whole with sure yeah you know um the the winters and uh over winter conditions leading into spring for lake trout really really don't have an impact that much on on angling for them uh you know it, it could ha have an impact if temperatures are cold enough to where it it um, messes around with smelt migration a little bit while they're spawning uh, because you know smelt being non-native um, they're the the most abundant non-native prey fish in Lake Superior uh, and in the springtime when they're spawning the the smelt will move in near shore to spawn and the lake trout follow right behind them um, so you know if, if there is going to be an impact from any overwinter conditions it might be you know if it's if it's too cold to, to get smelt moving in near shore right away in the spring that might be pushed out a little bit but you know typically lake trout uh, you know they occupy mostly, you know, towards the bottom where temperatures barely change, um, you know, compared to surface temperatures. So they're, you know, they're very well adapted to Lake Superior. Um, we've had high abundances of lake trout. I think this past uh, spring lake trout assessment for us was the highest numbers that we've ever seen before. So, uh, you know, we've got great numbers of lake trout out there and it looks to be, you know, a good fishing season here, but uh, I had mentioned to a bunch of anglers uh, a few days back that um, during our fall hydroacoustic and midwater trawl surveys on Lake Superior, um, where we, we estimate Cisco abundance for uh, our commercial quotas, we did see a really good 2022 year class of Cisco, Bloater, and Kayai, their uh, native prey fish for Lake Superior. And, and by the looks of it, it, it could be a fairly epic year class that, you know, we might not have seen, uh, you know, in our careers. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of bait fish out there now. I imagine every predator is gorging themselves. And, and we heard over the over the summer and into the fall last year that it was some pretty tough fishing. Uh, and we know in the fisheries world that when you do have a high prey fish abundance and, and the predators are gorging themselves, it's going to be a tough bite for anglers. So. You know, we'll see what happens with this year class. We'll know whether or not it's it's actually as big as we think it is this spring when, when some of our other agencies around the lake, like uh, USGS does their bottom trawl surveys. Um, but, you know, it, it's good for Lake Superior that there's a big input of energy and food, uh, but it might be a little tough for anglers here in a, a few years if, if you know, uh, lake trout are actually gorging themselves to the point they don't want to move too much or, or go after anglers' uh, baits. So. Corey, you talked a little bit about uh, bait fish and having that abundance of bait fish right now. Is there anything else that ties into the numbers that you're seeing with lake trout? I mean, what else attributes to, to this uh, kind of bumper crop of fish you have in the system right now? Yeah, so uh, Lake Superior was the only great lake to retain any wild lake trout populations after sea lamprey invasion. Uh, it just worked out that, you know, the... the um, infestation of sea lamprey into Lake Superior being the last lake in the system um, right around the 1950s. Uh, sea lamprey did have an impact on, on lake trout, there's no doubt there, but they didn't wipe them out like they did in the other lakes. So right about that mid-1950 periods where we found uh, a chemical control for sea lamprey uh, and were able to knock those populations down, we had wild stock of lake trout left in Lake Superior that we could work with for rehabilitation. Uh, and then lake-wide through collaboration with uh, partner agencies and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, it was really a three-pronged approach to restoration in Lake Superior with uh, uh, fishing regulations, uh, sea lamprey control, and a stocking for rehabilitation program. Uh, and in Minnesota waters, we just discontinued stocking lake trout in, I wanna say it was 2017. Uh, because we had reached all of our rehabilitation goals uh, that we had set for ourselves. Uh, and what we were seeing was we were seeing the lake trout that we were stocking being eaten by other lake trout. Uh, so that's not a very efficient use of a stocking program when you're essentially stocking lake trout that are getting eaten out there. So um, that approach, especially the, 
the sea lamprey control and, and regulation of the commercial and the sport fisheries really allowed that lake trout population to rebound to where it is today. So you, you have this native population of lake trout. Uh, there's different subspecies of lake trout. Can you tell about the different subspecies that call Minnesota North Shore their home? I know you've got uh, at least a couple subspecies there. Yeah, we do. We've got the, the leans, uh, the lean lake trout, which is, you know, the, the typical lake trout that anglers are uh, uh, fishing for near shore. Typically, lean lake trout will, will inhabit uh, water, you know, 240 feet or shallower. Uh, then we have the Ciscoet morpho type of lake trout, which is a, a fat form. They tend to occupy waters greater than 400 feet, uh, and they're found as deep as, you know, 1,300 plus feet, as deep as Lake Superior is. Um, so they're a, they're a very uh, deep water adapted morpho type of lake trout. And then you've got humpers and red fins. Humpers and red fins are more of an offshore reef uh, uh, type of fish that um, likes hanging out on, along these shallower reefs, but surrounded by deep water offshore. So we will see a few humpers in our assessments, uh, the closer that we get up to uh, the Canadian border, Nile Royal that way. Um, but typically in Minnesota, we'll see the, the leans and the Siskiwets, uh mostly in our assessment surveys and in, in our uh, sport fisheries. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I'm over here on Lake Ontario, I spent my life uh, chasing these trout and salmon here, wa uh, watched it come from the ashes. We did have uh, lake trout extinction here. Um, they're, they're trying to get it, get it reestablished. They're, they're finding some naturals. They get really excited when they do find them, usually in the bottom trawls when they're doing alive assessment, things like that. But it's always been fascinating to hear about Lake Superior, and uh, I definitely want to make it to that rock. Is it Standard Rock? Standard definitely Rock, oh, yeah. Get there someday. Um, yep. Yeah, standard. Um, now, what uh, that said, uh, do you see many um, Pacific salmon in your fishery? I do see uh, maybe show now and again where they show returns to certain rivers. I know they're all wild now, but yep. uh, do you do you have that in, in your area? Yeah, we do. So uh, you know, in our sport fishery, we have Chinook, Coho, Pink, Salmon. Uh, we have Rainbow Trout. Uh, we'll catch the occasional brown trout every once in a while, either a, a naturalized wild produced brown trout or uh, brown trout uh, stocked, the sea for Ellen stocked, I think mostly by Wisconsin. Um, but we do have naturally reproducing populations of Chinook, Coho, and Pinks in our waters. Um, we did have a stocking program for Chinooks back in the early 2000s. Um, and when we evaluated that fishery, that stocking program, uh, using our creel surveys, looking at what anglers were catching, essentially what we found was 90 to 95 plus percent of the Chinooks being caught by anglers were wild produced fish. Um, and the numbers of adult Chinook that we had returning to the French River, where we were uh, uh, getting eggs, doing our egg take operations from, drop down to such low of a level that it really wasn't feasible to keep that program going. So, um, you know, one of the things that I always like to say in, in Lake Superior is that we are very different from all of the other Great Lakes, uh, primarily in thermal habitat, cold water and depth. And that cold water and that depth affects our productivity and how much fish we can produce. Right. And with our heavy stock of lake trout that we have now, we have seen our prey fish populations decline over time, which is to be expected. Right. You you rehabilitate and restore your top level native predator. You should expect some of those prey fish populations to decline over time. And that's what we've seen. Um, and again, with the, the cold, pretty infertile uh, water that Lake Superior has, we don't have the huge uh, bait fish populations that the other Great Lakes do. Uh, in fact, we've gotten some of the initial results from our lakewide diet study uh, that we did in 2021 back. And along Minnesota's North Shore, we actually saw Chinooks eating more terrestrial insects and mysis, which is a freshwater shrimp, small shrimp. Uh, we've seen them eat more terrestrial insects and mysis than fish. And that kind of goes with the perception that we had from our own samples and from angler comments in 2021 that it was a really bad smelt year. They just weren't hanging around. Um, uh, it was low abundance overall based on some other assessments that we've seen. And we just don't have the productivity, especially in those years like 
uh, the past year where spring seemed to stretch on into, you know, mid June and that cold water hung around for a long time. So, uh, it's going to be neat to see with this, uh, uh, with this potential recruitment event of Cisco bloater and Kai uh, from 2022, it's going to be neat looking at those predator diets and seeing how they change because in Lake Superior, if you're a small silvery fish, there's something big chasing you. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that looks, uh, this coming summer and fall and uh, we'll definitely you know keep our eyes on on that prey fish population yeah we're getting a few questions uh asking about forage uh derek mule says he's caught quite a few lake trout for grasshoppers i'm not sure where derek fishes um and then we got a quite or uh, something here from nick cook and again this is uh probably actually be more a uh, question that you could a- answer better uh vince uh just asked are you finding lake trout feeding on gobies more than cisco so it's kind of seasonal for us. Um, they absolutely uh, target gobies early in the spring. They're, the lake trout are in uh, shallower water than the alawife movement. Uh, smelt, for the most part, are either in uh, the Niagara River or they're yet to come in shallower. So, yes, we, we find many more gobies in the vapor in the lake trout than we would alawives or smelt. Uh, when he asks... I believe he's from your area, though, Corey. Do you find that I'm eating more gobies than Cisco's or smelt? Yeah, our our goby populations are are fairly limited to uh, the nearshore natural embayments like the St. Louis River, um, and we really don't see a, a big goby population out in the main basin of Lake Superior. Um, but what we typically find in lake trout are lake trout are a very generalist feeder in Lake Superior. Um, essentially anything that's available to them, they'll eat, uh, you know, we see obviously smelt and, um, uh, herring or Cisco and and some of the other native prey fish species. But then, you know, during the summer, we do see, uh, a heavy, heavy feeding on, uh, terrestrial insects. So insects that are, you know, falling out of the sky and they get caught in, in the currents and they make these bug slicks and, and those fish will be up there. Um, feeding off the surface on those bug slicks regularly. And we even see that in that deep water form, uh, uh, Siskiwet lake trout. You know, those fish, you know, living 400, 800, 1200 feet down, we'll see in their stomachs bugs as well. So there's ma- they're making some pretty huge migrations coming up to the surface to feed. And again, I think that all goes back to, you know, the, the prey fish limitations that we do have in Lake Superior based on that, that cold water and productivity. Um, but yeah, some of the neat things that, you know, we found in this, in this diet study are, you know, snakes and, and, you know, uh, grouse legs and birds. And, uh, I think we've found our second bratwurst now, uh, in Minnesota, we found a bratwurst in the stomach of a Cisco back in about 2014, I think it was. Uh, and we just find all sorts of weird things in the stomachs of the lake trout. It seems like, you know, they're, they're they're built for Lake Superior. They're built for that cold water, and they'll take advantage of whatever whatever food source is out there. Yeah, that that uh, fish must have been down in Wisconsin. Hey, we got uh, Randy Kruger checking in too from Facebook, and Randy wants to talk about a topic that you and I were the last time we talked. And this is something where when we start talking about Lake Superior, people get really excited about it. Uh, the, the coaster brook trout. So you want to touch on coaster brook trout for a few minutes? Yeah, sure. You know we've we've I can start from the beginning, you know, back before uh, clear cut logging in the 1800s and early 1900s. And then the fires that pretty much ruined the the cold water swamps along the North shore that provided our rivers with cold water. uh, Brook trout were everywhere. You know, you hear initial reports of, you know, the uh, folks back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, taking Mackinac skiffs out of Duluth, paddling them up the shore and catching uh, 300 brook trout out of the mouth of the French river averaging like two and a half, three, four pounds, uh, no problem. So back in the day, you know, when habitat was great and those populations were strong, brook trout were a fantastic fishery. Uh, the last five years in particular, we've invested pretty heavily in trying to better understand our brook trout populations here on the North Shore. Uh, in Minnesota on the North Shore here, we have waterfall barriers within the first couple hundred yards from the lake. Uh, so we have above barrier brook trout populations, and then we have below barrier spawning brook trout populations. And then we have coaster populations that are in Lake Superior that we know of. 
Uh, so we're really focusing on a uh, genetic aspect of those three populations and how they're interacting with each other, whether or not we're getting below barrier reproduction or if those fish are uh, reproducing out in Lake Superior, or if all of the fish that we see below barrier and in the lake are coming from above barrier populations. Those are, those are kind of the, the big key issues right now that we're trying to focus on. With brook trout, uh, we're also really focusing on protection of good habitat and restoration of poor habitat, especially protection and restoration of any cold water seeps and springs that might be uh, in our tributaries because on the North shore of Minnesota, we have clay and bedrock and we don't have good groundwater input. So a lot of our water is is flow overland flow that can get pretty warm in the summertime and, and pretty low if we don't see rain events. So we're really working on habitat protection and restoration and uh, uh, hopefully we, we see uh, continuing growing numbers of brook trout and coaster brook trout, the 20, 22 inch fish in our surveys. Yeah, it's, if you've never been to this area, it is, uh, it's mountainous and a lot of volcanic rock. And like you said, waterfalls. If you like to go see waterfalls, the North Shore is a great place to go. You can drive up the shore uh, north of two harbors and it seems like every, you know, five or six miles there's a big set of waterfalls. It's, can we talk a little bit about the challenges of fishing uh, all those reefs and all that rock that you have there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I first started myself uh, fishing on Lake Superior here, I made the pretty uh, dumb rookie decision to try to drop an anchor in, in somewhat shallower water in the springtime and try jigging and I dropped it down and, and, and realized right away that I wanted to move a little bit. And the first time I took a tug on my anchor line, it was stuck. So, you know, that you can't drop an anchor. If you've got iPilot and you can put that on, on park mode and just hang out there, that's great. Um, but if you're going to be doing anything on, on Lake Superior, especially along the North shore, you know, having a good graph with the, uh, the bathymetry, uh, and and having all of uh, the contour lines on your graph is is a fantastic resource, uh, and keying in on kind of those flat areas where if you if you are downriggering like I do, I just have a downrigger with a hand crank, so I don't have any any fancy uh, downriggers tied into my graphs that automatically go up and down. Right, if if I'm out there trolling and I come across a reef, I better be in the back cranking that sucker up pretty quick. So um, yeah, you gotta you gotta keep on the keep on the graph keep watching the graph and uh you know when i'm fishing for lake trout i'll drop my downrigger you know about a foot off the bottom even even here on lake superior because it seems like that's where you have to be right you can't you can't be six feet ten feet above and, and catch a lot of fish but if you can get in that one to two feet off the bottom um you're gonna get a, a good number of fish hookups um and yeah absolutely you got to watch the graph and get a good card with good uh depth contours on it yeah, it's a real challenge when you're fishing something like that because you just have so many humps and ups and downs out there. It's just a, a really interesting area to look at when you start pulling up your charts and taking a look at what you have. Yep. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the neat things that we have on the North Shore here as well is is we have a really good jig fishery where, you know, essentially you can take your your walleye gear and your walleye boat out and find a, a hump out there uh, close to shore and uh, drop a jig down and jig off those those uh, uh, rock outcrops or whatever structure is laying down there. And it's a really neat way. I mean, you know, you fish 120, 150 feet of water with walleye gear jigging and you tie into, a, you know, a, a five or 10 pound lake trout. It, it's a pretty fun fight. So, uh, you know, if folks are interested in, in trying out something new, there's a lot of information online from uh, jig, jig anglers up this way. And you don't need a, a 30 plus foot boat to get out there and enjoy the resource. Uh, watch the weather, uh, get a good weather app and uh, watch the near shore for forecasts and get out there and have fun. Very good. Corey Goldsworthy from the Minnesota DNR. Thanks for coming on, talking a little trout with us. I uh, really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks again. Great seeing you.